Welcome. We have a program tonight on the history of Highlands Ranch, actually before it was Highlands Ranch. And we're doing it in stories, with stories, facts and stories. So I hope that you will enjoy it. I'm sure you will. Okay, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Beeman, Dr. Marvin Beeman. And Dr. Beeman's father um, was with the Hunt Club, the Arapaho Hunt Club. But Dr. Beeman will tell you all about that. So without further ado, if you'd like to come up. Dr. Beeman is a practicing veterinarian. Well, what a pleasure it is to see all of you come to listen about the history of Highlands Ranch. Uh, <clears throat> Fifty-seven, and I moved from Sedalia with my mother and dad in 1934 down to where the law enforcement center is on the south side of Highlands Ranch. And uh, it, it, the house was a one room. How many of you have been to the law enforcement center? That little, that little brick, little stone building that's right there as you come in. And it, it uh, was a one room when my mother and dad moved there in 1934. I was a year old. Uh, we came from Sedalia. That's where they lived. My dad went to work there in 1929. <laughs> That's kind of an interesting story about what his story going to work for Mr. Phipps. Mr. Phipps leased that area from Kistler. And those of you that have been to the, how many of you have been in the, in the mansion at Highlands Ranch? Well, Mr. Phipps, you saw that, you know, and you've read that history, so you know that he leased the South Park for the, the Arapaho Hunt Club in 1929. And my father was a friend of one of the people that worked down there, and he, his friend called him and said, we need some help at the Hunt Club. Would you come to work? And he went down there, and he looked around, and Dad was raised well, in fact, he, he was born in Sedalia, and so he was on a ranch both there where the Duncan place is at the corner of 105 and, and 65, or 61, 62, whatever that road is. That the Duncan place, that was where my dad was, was born, was there. Then they moved to, to a ranch up on Jackson Creek. But anyway, my dad said, well, I'll come and help you with the horses, but I don't want anything to do with those damn dogs. <laughs> Well, he left 56 years later. So that, that's how I got the history. And that's my father on that horse right there. That's uh, one of the ones that Mr. Phipps and he raised. Uh, she was part Percheron. In fact, she was 15, 16, thoroughbred, and a 16th Percheron, and was an excellent, excellent horse. In today's world, in the hunter jumper world, I would wager to say she'd bring somewhere between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars. That's what those kind of horses are selling for. And those hounds that you see there are English foxhounds. They're the first progeny from them came from England. Mr. Phipps had hunted in England, and he was interested. And then when he got the hunt started, he he brought some English hounds, and then we got several English hounds from hunts back east and in Canada. So consequently, that, that's what he, we was very unique because we were the only mounted fox hunting people in the United States that chased coyotes. And this hunt, the Arapaho hunt, was the second oldest recognized hunt west of the Mississippi River. There was a military post in the state of Washington that was the first one. And they're still in existence as we're still in existence. Of course, we're not there anymore. And interestingly enough, that picture that you see there is on the polo field. There was a polo field that Mr. Phipps paid for the tractor to level it and all of the machinery. And my dad and I drove the tractor 
I drove the tractor part of the time. Fact of the matter is, I was down there driving the tractor one day, and I was so mesmerized. It was a D2 Caterpillar, and I was 14 years old, so I had no damn business running the Caterpillar, but I was using the Land Rover. <laughs> I hooked a light pole with the bulldozer, and the wires both made a big mess. And, and uh, I, I, did, I didn't tell my dad right away what I did, but he went and saw the post. And so, anyhow, Mr. Phipps had that built, and that's where we played. We played polo there on that for several, several years. Had a lot of high competition. In fact, we had a young man started his career there. And any of you know about the rating in polo? He became a 10 goal player, and that's the highest rating anybody in the world is, is 10 goal. That he started was playing on that field. So anyway, that, that's that part of it. And as I said, I moved to Highlands Ranch in that little building was a one-room house. And then a little bit later on, they built two bedrooms on the side of it. Those of you that have been to the Law Enforcement Center, there's a brick, brick extension to the north. And they, it had a kitchen when they built those. They built a kitchen on there. And I can remember mem very many consequential things that happened there. Uh, my mother, one thing that really rings out in my career is she had a two-cycle gas engine washing machine. And then she had to run the exhaust pipe out the side of the porch. And <laughs> I can remember when it wouldn't work and my mother would get a little angry. But anyhow, we didn't have electricity now at that on on the south ranch until 1946 we got electricity on july the third in 1946 there was an electrician from Levere's that put in the, the the electric in the houses and the light pole rea is the one that sent the electricity up to the, to the south ranch and he climbed up the pole jumped the electrical, what, whatever you do. I don't know anything about electricity except it hurts. And the, he fixed it so that we could have a plug in the house. And my dad got an electric razor for his birthday. That's why I know what day it was and when it was. <laughs> I, I can still remember the electric razor going off and my dad thinking that was a hell of a deal. But, being raised on Highlands Ranch there at the Hunt Club was a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. Uh, I, I started riding the horses when I was three years old. Dad put me on a pony, and that was highly unsuccessful. <laughs> Bucked me off and hung my foot up in the stirrup and banged my head a little bit. I think that's part of my problem the rest of my life. <laughs> but I went from a Shetland, that little bitty Shetland pony, to a great big horse. And his name was Old Man Rivers. And I thought he was a hell of a deal. And my mother had some chickens, and she fed the chickens wheat out of the basement of the house there. And I felt so good about my, that my big horse, I went and got about five gallons of wheat and by the gallon can and gave it to him. Thank God he didn't found her. But anyway, that's how I got started. And, and uh, what, what happened then proceeded was I started riding, in fact, I rode a horse to school from right, I don't know, some of you know where the old Gant school was. It was a one-room schoolhouse. Well, well, it was two rooms for a while, and then when the, when the magazine blew up in Levere's, the brick part of the two rooms separated. They condemned that part of the building. I was sitting in the seat. I can still remember at my desk sitting in the seat when that, when that thing blew up. And I looked up and saw the crack come in the building. And but when they condemned that, then we only had the one-room schoolhouse. We had a we did have a well there, and we it was a hand pump well. That was our water. And the boys' toilet was up on the hill, and the ladies' toilet was over on the side. And so it was quite a place. In that school, uh, the most I had in the whole school, when the eight years that I was there, the most was 13 twice. I never had a classmate a whole year, any one of the eight grades that I was there. And we got down to three twice. <laughs> you know what it was? It was like having a tutor. I was so nervous when I got older and wanted to go to college, I thought, how can anybody go to college 
with that, with that kind of an education. Well, it turns out it was a hell of an education because it was like a tutor. And from where, not where this, well, just a little way from where this picture was taken is I would ride over, over the hill a mile and a half to school and mom and dad would take me the first three grades, first grade, second grade, third grade. They would take me while they exercised the hounds over there and lead my horse back. And then when my sister, who was three years younger than me, she and I would ride double to school and they had a barn over at the schoolhouse. My horse would stay there all day and then we'd get back and ride home. And that worked really well till one day we we were in school and there was snow. We'd ridden to school and there was three boys in school at that time. So we decided we'd have a war. And I was going to be the cavalry and I was going to get on my horse and one of the kids was going to get on behind me. And we had snowballs and the other two boys was in the fort of the boys' toilet. And so we came out of the barn and we started up the hill and I started to canter the horse and the Kid got behind, behind me, he got scared, and he reached around and got a hold of my waist, put his, flank, his feet in the flanks of the horse, and she bucked us both off. And I hit the ground on top of him, knocked all the wind out of him, and I thought I'd killed him. He's laying there gasping for air. So that cavalry charge didn't last very long. But that's how I got started in school, and, and uh, it, it was so interesting. Uh, then, because of the war, it came and obviously December the 7th, 1941, my, my dad had started hunting the hounds. He was a whipper in, and I'll explain some of that here in just a minute. He was a whipper in for the huntsman. That huntsman left and my dad became the huntsman in 34. And then his youngest brother and my mother's youngest brother was a whipper in. Well, they both went away to the service and I started riding, helping my dad a lot. Then, and then I became a whipper in. And a whipper in, if you look at that picture now, on, on your left, right here, the horse with the strip down his face, and the little kid sitting on the horse, that's me, when I was 14 years old. No, no, I wasn't either, I was 12. And my dad's in the middle, and my uncle, who had been in the services next, and Mr. Phipps is the one right behind my dad in the middle of those hounds. And I was the youngest recognized whipper in in the Masters of the Foxhounds of America at age 10. And uh, so that, that means I've been riding horses on your Highlands Ranch country. Not right now since the houses are there. Been riding horses here on Highlands Ranch for 80 years. In fact, a little more than that because the first time I went hunting, I can remember I was about six years old and we were right in there. So I, I've been at this game a long, long time to explain the structure of hunting. My dad's a huntsman in the middle and the lady on the right, your right, she's a whipper in that took over for my uncles, uncles when they went to the service. She helped my dad and then that's when I started hunting. The horse I'm on was named Rickery and he was a wonderful horse. And he lived until I graduated from veterinary school. The week I graduated from veterinary school, he died. So I had him that long. And he, was, he wasn't a big, beautiful horse or anything, but he was wonderful for what I did. He, he just did about everything. I, I fell off a lot. And he, he, he'd wait for me. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, sometimes I'd fall off, be on the jump. I'd leave back up to the jump and get on and take another go at it. And usually made it the second time. But that's the structure there, and then as, it, as Highlands Ranch progressed, we, we hunted all of this country, this mountain. As you, how many of you know where Wildcat Mountain is? Right behind here. We hunted that country a lot, and uh, we, we would start at where the law enforcement center is and then hunt either north and where all you people live with all your houses, and all your trees was nothing but open ground. The fact of the matter is, I may be incorrect about this, but the furthest north of Oak Brush on the east side of the Rocky Mountains is just about where the high school is south of the mansion. That's the last one. And so that was Oak Brush, and from there, clear to the county line, was wide open country. 
And so we, we hunted all of that. Just, we'd start at the kennels, the law enforcement center, and if, if we wanted to, we went north, and we had a huge amount of long time gallops. One of the longest hunts we ever had from there, we started at the kennels, went to the county line, just about where Bowen's place is, where the Windcrest is, and then turned from there and went east, uh, crossed over where the cheese ranch is, went east and picked the hounds up just before you drop off into Castle Rock on I-25. And that was December the 6th, no, December the 8th in 1960. I'm going to tell you why I know that. Because we turn, it turns out that my, that hunt was about 30 miles long. And my wife was in the hospital with our daughter, <laughs> and I didn't get to the hospital to see her because I was out hunting. But that, that's the longest hunt that I remember us having. We came clear across here, just, just, this, just on the other side of, of Wildcat Mountain, and then went over and just parallel, I-25 wasn't there, and just parallel and stopped over there. And having said that, my daughter's here, and I'd like her to stand so you can see. This is our daughter, Lorianne, that was born, and I miss seeing her. <laughs> so it, it was such a wonderful situation. And you tell me when I'm running out of time, so uh, I, I don't want to. You'll tell me when I've talked enough. Uh, well, I, I did mention it had water, we had to pump it. It was, uh, <laughs> remember what I said about the toilet? One was up on the hill and the other was halfway up the hill. So we were pumping the water out of that shallow well. And we had a really good recreational situation. We had, a, we had an iron uh, merry-go-around and a teeter-totter and three swings. <laughs> And we, in the winter time, we had a good hill to sled off of, but uh, it, it was a. Uh, and to get back to tell the story about hunting from that schoolhouse, uh, one day my father and I had we had a hundred hounds at that time, and I was helping him exercise, and there was a straw pile up above the kennels, and there were three or four cows kind of playing king of the mountain on this straw pile, and it was 20 above zero, and about four to six inches of snow. Now this is a definition of being foolish or stupid, however you want to look at it. And so Dad said to me, he said, I wonder if they can run a coyote in this cold weather in the snow. And we had a vote, he and me, and we decided to go with those 100 hounds. And we went up there, and the scent was of the coyote was, coyotes were just perfect. We went from there, which was about a, a mile from being straight east of the Levere's, clear to the county line, right where Bowen's place is, or was, where Wincrest is. <laughs> and now think about that. It was cold, as I said. There was snow on the ground, and there were no cell telephones. That nobody had a clue where in the hell we were. If one of us would have had a wreck, which is a possibility, it, we'd have just, the other one just had to rid off home and let the other one freeze to death. Cause, <laughs> and wonder how we was going to do it. Now that was stupid, but boy was it exciting. <laughs> I've, I've never forgotten that situation. It was just so fascinating. It's, uh, the, the whole career here was because of Elsie Phipps Jr and what he did to, to generate that environment for us to have such a wonderful time. And uh, the, the horses, we started with a barn of seven, and it was an old barn. In fact, the matter is, there used to be, well, that barn is, is gone over at the Law Enforcement Center, but there used to be another barn foundation, just like it, about a half a mile from here. At the Griggs place, they had a barn. It was the same type for draft horses. They had seven stalls in it. Two each team. There were three teams in there. Then a hayloft up above it. But anyway, 
it went, that barn went from seven horses to 47 horses. Eventually, the hunt club had that many horses, and so that's the horses we used. People would board their horses there and hunt with us, and we would have as many as sometimes up close to 60, 70 people galloping around where all of you live. And we, we have a lot of stories to tell about that. The fact of the matter is, I'm going to tell you one more story, then I'm about out of time. But um, we were hunting over here, and we were chasing a coyote just about a quarter of a mile from here, and going straight south. And we'd had a big snow several days before, so the ground was pretty open except where the wind had blown in snow drifts. And I, the hounds were just, just about to get to Wildcat Mountain. And I was helping my dad as a whipper in and galloping along. And I didn't pay attention. There was a big snow drift. And we hit the snow drift. And my horse did a complete somersault. And in the process, I guess he stepped on my head. I had my hunting cap on. But anyway, when I woke up in the snow, I could see my horse over there about a quarter of a mile away. And I thought, I, I, I don't remember riding over there at all. <laughs> and the reason I didn't remember, I was unconscious. And when I came to, I thought my ear w was full of snow. And I kept trying to get, get the snow out of my ear. And pretty soon I looked and it was full of blood. Well, it turns out I had a basal skull fracture. So with blood running out my left ear and cerebral spinal fluid running out my nose. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I've survived several of those kind of wrecks. Anyway, I can't tell you how much the Highlands Ranch means to our family. Uh, our daughter started riding there, our son started riding there, my wife hunted with us that, there, and Mr. Phipps was so good to us, and the polo and the hunting, and we helped with the cattle when they needed to round up the cattle for branding, and in those days we dipped the cattle, or they dipped the cattle, and we put help them get out of the pastures. We had an interesting meeting at the mansion last fall, I think it was, and a fellow who had worked there was talking about it. Well, he didn't remember all of the pastures. We always called this the East Ranch, and then Mr. Fitz bought the Cheese Ranch, which was, it's still the windmill, still there. There was a wonderful dairy there. The German people had a, a really ingenuity type of dairy operation. And during the war, my dad had to go, when Mr. Fitz bought the cheese ranch, my dad had to go over and help milk the cows till they sold the cows. So I could just go on and on and on. There's one other quick story about Highlands Ranch. <laughs> we, we had, we had a, a mare that had a set of twins. And live twin foals happen one in 10,000 twin pregnancies. And this mare had, uh, had twins. My dad called me, and he said, you better hurry. Satin has just had one big baby, and I'm sure she's going to have another one. So I get my daughter out of bed and my son out of bed and my wife, and we go. We lived at Highlands Ranch, by the way, in one of the cottages when Lorian was born. And so we drove over the hill, and we get there. Just then, she had the second one, and the second one was about half as tall as the big one, and we call them little sister and little brother. And Lori Ann was two or three, well, she's four at that time, I think, three or four. Anyway, she and that little twin, the start of it was her grandfather, and she had to get up every three hours for three days and hand feed that little thing. But on the fifth day, that little foal, little tiny one went to the pasture with her mother and her brother. And then my daughter winds up riding a filly, unbeknown to us, but with a hauler, and the horse ran away with her. Not in being vicious, but she didn't have anything but a hauler, and rode up to my father, and my dad just looked at her and says, did you learn anything? Well, anyway, I've got a picture that shows her hunting that horse later on. And then, then she had a baby that was one of the best horses Mr. Phipps, my dad, ever raised. So I could just go on and on forever about this. Uh, it's it's uh, so exciting to have this opportunity to talk to you and explain how it all came about. And as, as, as I mentioned about the whipper ins and the huntsmen and so forth, I wound up as a whipper in for my dad for 40 years and then I hunted the hounds for 33 years and retired three years ago. 
I still still go on. I rode a horse yesterday about eight miles, and I'm going to ride one tomorrow morning too if I can. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Philip Scott, and after that I'll just say good night because I can't follow that <laughs> at all. Did bring back a memory. Hi. Okay, I'm going to introduce you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Philip Scott was the first homeowner to close a home in Allen's Ranch. He has some very interesting stories to tell also. The first one I did want to mention that our president of the Highlands Ranch Historical Society put together this um, PowerPoint for us, and we do appreciate it very much. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, okay. You want to go over there? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Doc Beeman's got stories that are incredible. One memory you brought back for me, they put me on a Shetland pony. My great-grandparents homesteaded in the Sand Hills. My great-grandfather was a Civil War vet, cavalry soldier. And they put me on a Shetland pony. A little closer. Shetland ponies are a crime against nature. They, they, they should be out chasing cats and not be ridden by kids. It threw me off in about three steps, stepped on my chest, and then I got a real horse. So my wife Kay's with me. She was born in the Sand Hills. Um, I haven't known her very long. My mom took me to the hospital and she was born. And our moms were best friends, so she took me down. My wife was there in a bassinet. So how long, honey? 20 years? <laughs> we were fortunate to close. We got drawn in a drawing. And we got to close here. Highlands Ranch and moved in and have been here since. As we grew up in Littleton. My mom left the ranch up there and left my dad behind for various reasons. So I grew up in Littleton, got out of Littleton High School. As kids, the Phipps would, my best friend from grade school on owned the Littleton Clinic and was the Phipps doctor. So we got to hunt the Highlands Ranch for pheasant and geese and to poke around where we wanted. Warren Huber was the foreman at the time. And it really graveled him that Earl and I could drive around his fields because he thought they were his, but we figured that one out. So we grew up being able to run the Highlands Ranch all along county line when we felt like. Same with the, with the Grant Ranch, which is now Raccoon Creek. And it was a different world. All, no paved roads, county line was dirt, Broadway quit. I-25 stopped down at County Line Road. But they put our name in a, in a jar. I think interest rates were 18%. And Mission Viejo had been bought by Philip Morris because cigarettes were going by the wayside. They bought 7-Up, Miller Brewing, Mission Viejo companies. And they put out 100 packages, I think, of 12% interest rate, which was phenomenal. And Jim Tepper had this spinner with ping pong balls in it and reached in and just by luck pulled us out first. So we got to close first, and that's, we haven't left since. Is it closer? Yes. Yeah, it's hard to do. So our children grew up here. It's been a wonderful place to be. Um, first year, Kay flew for Continental Airlines and was out of town, and I had Sarah, who was nine months old, and in diapers. Art Cook was running the cattle operation with Jim Tepfer, and, and they had a lot of cattle up at the ranch. And, and I'm not sure Art, he is a Stanford grad. Art was, Art Cook graduated from Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, he was an attorney, so he knew a lot about cows. <laughs> and and what, he, what I told him, because he called me up on the morning of the blizzard, Christmas of, of 81, it snowed a massive amount, 30 inches. And I always took a loader home to our first house because I had a construction company. I took a big loader home and parked it outside the house because then I knew I could get to Broadway and I could get to County Line. And Art called up and he had Jim with him and said, the cows have busted out and they've gone east. And I said, that's because they'll go with the wind. If a cow turns into the wind, 
It'll suffocate, right, Doc? What happens is the snow swirls and floods up there. Right, the sn it'll suffocate. If they face the, the snowstorm, it'll fill up their lung, their nose, and they won't breathe. So they'll go with the wind. We found them at Cheese Ranch. I just followed the, the herd track in that loader, and then and I had to take Sarah with me because I couldn't leave her home alone. She's nine months old. So I had half a dozen diapers and five bottles, and Jim and Art in their whatever they drove, Wagoneer, some such a big rig, following my tracks. And we found the cattle down at Cheese Ranch, and I widened the path, and they took them back. Got back up the mansion, and Jim climbed up on that loader and said, what can I ever do? And I handed him a bag of five dirty diapers, and I said, if, if, you'll, get, if you'll get rid of these, we're even, Jim. So that was, that was, and then I dug out the ranch three other times, 03, 06, because I always knew that, and I had more bottles of wine, and I don't drink wine. Everybody in the ranch would come, there we are, right? take this, and I'd go, oh, thanks. And, and I'd have to make a stop off at the house to unload all the wine bottles. And so my kids would break into them and steal them when we weren't working. So it, it turned out well. I don't, uh, it's been great. My mom was a postmaster in Sedalia, so we moved back in here from down in Sedalia after growing up in Littleton. And everything that Doc tells you about the Highlands Ranch was true and more. It was a it was a godsend to the country that the Phipps did what they did with it and had people like Doc Dunton to keep a tradition alive because the hunt club was a real tradition. And that's pretty much about it for us. I've got photos. Oh, I don't know who the guy is, <laughs> but that's when we closed on the house. That's Kay and Sarah. And she was not born in Highlands Ranch. She was not the first child. She was born in Sedalia. Same people, and that's the house we bought. And it was, it was a big deal for us. We came out of a real small house down in Sedalia, on, below the castle down there. And that's, I don't know who the two people in front are. Kay, do you know who that is? Probably people wanted the house and didn't get it. So, so we let them look once and then moved on. That was, and then they gave us a steer after that for being the first closers on it. They brought the steer over and unloaded it. And I think Art took it down to Elizabeth and made a hamburger out of it. That's probably, that is not the wayward children that we chase down. But I don't know, how, how many cattle did they run out here, Doc? Well, they had up to 900. 900 head? Yeah. And the, what we went after was only about maybe 250 or 300 out of that pasture and, and just east of the old barns. And I can't tell you their names. <laughs> yeah, so the, and this is Gary who's up next. the same time at the yeah. Philip and the... Uh... Second house. Okay. Okay. Mary Danny is going to share some stories he has and tell us a lot of facts about Highlands Ranch, the very beginning. Well, we, we weren't riding horses here in 1960, but uh, we, I moved here uh, in 1981 and worked for Mission Viejo Company as manager of production control. And uh, my brother came from California uh, back in 1979. He was a director of Mission Bio, California. Came out here to uh, build a ranch and I came out here on vacation in 1981 and uh, went to a company picnic and uh, sat with Joe Blake. Some of you people might know Joe Blake and Jim Teffer and uh, they offered me a job and I said, 
Carol and I stood in the front steps of the mansion that night. Said, we're moving my wife in the crowd here, back there. But uh, said, we're moving to Colorado. We stood in the front steps of the mansion. The sun was going down over the mountains. Nothing was built in Highlands Ranch. And we said, well, we're going to move. So we went back to Michigan, sold our home, and then we're the, uh, one of the first families to move into Highlands Ranch. They wouldn't let me close first because uh, they didn't want to give that steer away to an employee. It didn't look too good. So anyway, and then uh, we're in our home for two weeks, and Jennifer, my daughter, was born. And uh, so she was the first baby born in Highlands Ranch. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, there's a little story behind that. I was sitting in my office, and Jim Teffer came up to me, slammed the door behind him, he came up to my office and said, Danny, I got a bone to pick with you. And I said, what is it, Jim? You know, I'm all scared type of deal. He said, you beat me. And I said, oh, because his daughter, his granddaughter was the second baby born on the ranch. She was born three days later. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I thought I'm in big trouble. And uh, he took his hand out and congratulated me on our baby being born. So he was, a, he was just a great guy, Jim Teffer. One of the, he was the president of Mission Vale, Calif uh, Colorado, and one of the founders of Mission Vale, California, back in 1973. Or well, 69, they opened up. So anyway, that's the story there. We'll move on. These are a couple of important guys in the elementary school. There's Joe Blake on the bottom down there. He's the one that hired me with a dark coat. Rick O'Connell was a good friend of mine. He's a superintendent of schools, just got hired in 1981. And uh, they're looking at the school site for uh, Northridge with the first school born in the ranch and how that all came about. Uh, luckily, as they mentioned, uh, Philip Morris, old Mission Bay Company, had big time money. So the first school, Mission Viejo, built the school for $10 million, and then they had a 10-year deal where the Douglas County would pay them back for the school in 10 years. And then the 10 years came along, and they gave that money back to Douglas County again, and they built Summit View High School, uh, Elementary School over by the mansion. But anyway, that's how we had a school right off the bat, is Mission Viejo paid for it. And uh, that's Joe Blake. And Rick O'Connell was the superintendent of schools for about 25 years. And Douglas County Schools at the time was not highly recommended. The matter of fact, the first kids here until they built the high school, that the junior high school and high school had to be sent to Castle Rock, which was 45 minutes each way uh, to get back. The other, and that was real important for the ranch to get started, was a school system. And uh, in 1984, we got a $125 million bond, capital bond, put on the Douglas County ballot. And Joe Blake, myself, and Mary Putnam, and uh, the president of the uh, parent-teacher organization, Kim Herskovitz, got together and said, how are we going to get this thing passed? So Joe had the idea that we'd do a phone tree. So we did a phone tree two weeks before, one week before, two days before, and then the day of the vote and got 90% of the people who lived in Highlands Ranch to go and vote. Because the rest of Douglas County did not want to pay for Highlands Ranch development. And when the, the bond passed 125 million by 10 votes. And we had over 90% of the people at Highlands Ranch. So that put Highlands Ranch on the map for the school. It was, it was uh, designated to pay for the high school, the junior high school, and five elementary schools. So uh, that was really important of getting the ranch going. Okay, I think I got the school down. Here's Northridge Elementary School, and then uh, uh, it was really a nice school. My kids all went to school there. The school was run by uh, uh, Doug McFarland. He was the principal there to start with. It opened up in October of 82, and just a wonderful school. They had all fresh, brand new teachers, you know, being a brand new school, where the school district at the time was very small in Douglas County. So they, when they built the school, they had to hire all new teachers. And uh, my kids never came home from school complaining about a teacher. They loved that school. And uh, so that was uh, the first school in Highlands Ranch was Northridge Elementary. They didn't build the next school uh, up until, uh, it was about four or five years later. Kind of give you an idea of the history of Highlands Ranch. I was manager of production control in 81. And when Mission Vio bought this property, they, they thought they were going to build it out in 17 years. I was putting projections together and schedules to build 1,700 homes a year 
1,700 homes a year, and uh, <laughs> we're only selling 300 to 400. So uh, the interest rates are 18 percent, and as uh, Philip said, uh, Mission Viejo, a Citicorp bank, bought that down for the first 100 customers of the Highlands Ranch down to 12 percent. We thought we got gold at that time. It was a great deal. But uh, anyway, there is a school. There's Doug McFarlane. He's on the uh, right over there. He is the principal of uh, the school. And then after they built Crest Hill, I mean, yeah, Crest Hill Middle School, he went over there and became principal of that school too. Not two, both at the same time, but later on. Here's the original rec center that we had. And uh, this is owned by uh, uh, Mission Viejo built a rec center. As you can see, it's fairly small. And we had a pool, a little uh, meeting room, and we had an exercise room and a children's play room when you first came in, and three tennis courts off to the side. And these are two swimming pools that we had here. And uh, that was Bayfield on the end down there, and then the groves of the subdivision on the other side here, and then the Stony Point was to the right. But uh, that's the first rec center. And then in, it was around 1984, I was on the uh, delegate and on the board of directors of the HRCA, which is the Highlands Ranch Community Association. Because of my connection with Mission Viejo Company, they uh, came to me and said, we need a bigger rec center. So I went to Joe Blake and we put a deal together. And uh, we came up with $8 million, which would probably be about $24 million today. And Mission Viejo gave us $5 million, and then $3 million with a loan from the Homeowners Association with, and I put all kinds of restrictions in there that they couldn't foreclose on the homeowners if Mission Viejo disappeared and couldn't pay on that. We didn't have to pay that loan. And then it had a cap of 15,000 residents for that rec center before they had to build a new one. So then we put an $8 million addition onto that building and put the gym, the indoor pool, and all that stuff inside and uh, added you know, seven more tennis courts. So that was the deal. Mission Viejo came along and we built a new rec center. Not new, but we added quite a bit to it. This is Northridge Park. Now this park right here, uh, they had a really nice playground there. The park right here is owned by the Metro District. Now the Metro District, a little story behind them, that got started in 1979, and they put in all the parks of the ranch. They put in the water and sewer. That was Centennial, but uh, still goes through the Metro District, and then the, uh, all the roads and all that stuff. And uh, back in 1979, Philip Morris, we had District Number 1, Philip Morris went out and got a bond at about 7% interest, and it was guaranteed by Philip Morris Company, so we had a very good rate. That's why we got a 7% interest. And then we had that money and then we put that money in the bank. Well, then when the interest rates on CDs got to be 17, 18%, we're making 10% a year or $12 million a year on those funds for, well, for a few years. And that really helped the ranch get started. They had all that extra money from the bonds and the interest that we're getting. So that was a neat deal from Mission. But uh, the big success in Mission Vale was just great developers, two of them. Mission Viejo Company, owned by Philip Morris with all the money. Besides the other things that Phil mentioned, they also owned Kraft, Kraft Foods. So they had all the money. And during the 80s, when it was really slow here, they just kept on pumping money and losing money on the ranch, but kept it going. And I used to go to meetings with Joe Blake uh, every couple of weeks, uh, different things going on in the ranch. And he always used to say, you know, Gary, because I'm saying, God, you spend a lot of money on this stuff. He said, you know we're building a place to raise your family. And that was the whole intent of the ranch in the very beginning. They called it your hometown. That was the big marketing story and a place to raise your family. And that was the key behind Highlands Ranch and all the principles of Mission Viejo Company, then Shea Homes to build what the kids have here. We built up, we didn't have any uh, sports programs. We put that all in place. We built a first class school system. Douglas County in the late 80s, early 90s was rated one of the best in the state. Uh, we, you know, you have all the trails that kids can ride their bikes on. They got the open space, but it was a place to raise your family. Now, we're a place for grandparents to come to visit their parents, family. There's Jim Teffer, he was a great guy. Uh, 
He, uh, he was the leader of this place. He came from California. He is one of the original founders of Mission Bayo Company back in the early 60s. And uh, he just died last year, a year ago. And uh, he was, uh, his personality and his uh, vision was huge in the success of Highlands Ranch. There's a P, all the PAs, but there's Art Cook. He was a, we got together so much, my kids used to call him uncle. Uh, we got together all the time. He was a best friend of mine, and uh, we did a lot of stuff. Now, he was in charge of the activities committee and all. He was in charge of the ranch and the activities uh, of the ranch, and uh, just a great guy. So we put on, for the first 12 years of the ranch, we had a thing called the activities committee, and then uh, well, Art was uh, overseeing that whole thing, and uh, he loved his horses, uh, even though he wasn't a cowboy. And Jim Teffer one time said, one way to make $3 million in a, uh, make a million dollars in a, a horse operation, I mean, in a cattle operation, is to start off by giving Art Cook $3 million. He spent a lot of money. <laughs> but that was a famous story Teffer used to tell about Art Cook. And Art Cook and Teffer even took vacations together. And uh, just, they just had fun. They had fun doing stuff together. And, uh, he was a great friend. He came over from California in 1979 with my brother. This is the start of the Highlands Ranch Board of Directors for the Community Association. And in, in uh, July of 82, I might be going too long here, I'm not sure. July of 82, Joel Blake, which is the second from the right over there, uh, took all of the homeowners of the Highlands Ranch together in the... Uh, we had a meeting at Northridge Rec Center, explained how it was going to work, and we elected our officers and whatever. And at the time, they had three members of uh, Mission Viejo Company and two residents on that board. That's my brother that was a director of the Mission Viejo Company on the far left. He was one of the first, uh, he came here, uh, manager of budget and administration and uh, forecasting uh, type of deal. But uh, anyway, that's how it all became. And then at that meeting, I became uh, uh, chair of the finance committee uh, at that particular time. Oh, that's the same picture of uh, uh, Joe Blake Hellstrom. Uh, there's Bill Hallstrom on the right and Joe Blake. And then you had Marty Mercer, Bob Barlow. Though they're both my neighbors and then my brother uh, were the first members of the board of directors of the HRCA. This is the activities committee. That's me right in the middle of my hand pointing at the paper. But uh, Art Cook came to my office in October of 81 and said, hey, we're gonna, we got to set up an art activities committee. We need to get some people. So a lot of those people that you see right there are my neighbors. Uh, and uh, what we did is we put on the first Christmas event where we put Christmas tree lights on Broadway and all the light on all the trees. And then we had a little red house. I'm not sure, I think I got a picture of the red house coming up here. And uh, we, uh, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, we got out there, sang a bunch of hymns. Then Art Cook was on the microphone. He said, he directed Santa Claus to come into Highlands Ranch as we turned on the lights to let Santa Claus know where we were at. And uh, the kids all went crazy. Not all the kids, we only had about 100 people living in the ranch here at the time. But everybody showed up. It was just a great event. But that's the original uh, activities committee. This is Mary Putnam on the left. She was Art Cook's boss. She was the director of all activities in Highlands Ranch. She was director of the mansion. And uh, she was my neighbor. So she was like a sister to me for quite a few years. But yeah, those are all old friends I see in this picture here. This is, uh, <laughs> there's Joe Blake on the right. This is when we opened uh, Northridge Park. And there's Carol and I, my wife and I. Uh, and our, we got Joe Blake uh, giving us a uh, uh, couple of pancakes at the opening of the Northridge Park. This is the mansion. I mean, we had a bunch of parties. Mission Viejo gave us the mansion the first 12 years for any party we wanted, and plus they gave us all the money. So we had all kinds of parties going on uh, out there all the time. One, the first party, we had the Christmas get together, then we had a New Year's Eve party that year at the mansion, and then uh, uh, this party right here, this might have been the roundup uh, that we had. 
There's a funny story behind this. The first party we had outdoors, we had a barbecue and that, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But Philip Morris, being a cigarette company, gave a, put a bunch of packs of cigarettes in all the tables, four little, little sample packs, four packs. And the kids are running around pretending like they're smoking cigarettes. Well, they never put out cigarettes again. I think it was Kim Herskovitz came out and said, hey, <laughs> she knew Jim Teffer because uh, Jim Teffer's daughter lived next door to him, Kim Herskovitz, and said, you don't need to put cigarettes out at the parties when we have a lot of kids around. So that was a big deal, getting the cigarettes. But we had all the beer we could drink. We got free beer. Miller Lite was really popular at the time. And, all the beer we wanted, uh, Art Cook would just call a distributor and we fill up, we had a little little room at the mansion, we just filled it up with beer. And uh, so other great, Mission Vail gave us a lot of money. You can go on here from here. This is Steve Rude, this is one of the barbecues we had. And uh, Steve Rude was a controller of uh, Mission Vail Company. But uh, the barbecue started, uh, Art Cook and my, Mary Putnam and myself are sitting around, what are we going to do for the roundup? And uh, so uh, Art said, let's do a barbecue. So we had a big hole, six foot deep hole. We dug it in the back of the mansion. Art Cook, myself, uh, Dave Cooper, which is my neighbor and a very good friend of mine, and uh, Mary Putnam, we, the day before, we wrapped about 20 prime ribs. We uh, rubbed them put aluminum foil around them with a little uh, wire. We did that in the back of the, the kitchen of the mansion. And then our, we got a big fire in there, let it burn down. And then we put the, uh, the uh, barbecue right on the coals, covered it up with a sheet of st uh, steel, and then put sand on top of it. And then the next day, about 11 o'clock, we took them all out. And it was to die for. It was a big hit. We had that barbecue for every event. Uh, from that day on. The big advantage of working that thing like that, any barbecue left over, I used to take it home. <laughs> but that barbecue was great stuff. And this is the Roundup. We had the Roundup in, uh, it was the spring of 82, the first outdoor event that we had here in Highlands Ranch. And they brought the cattle in, they branded them, gave them a shot, vaccination, whatever, and uh, sent them on their way. We sat on the fence post out here. And coming from Michigan and half the people out here, uh, that was pretty, that was a real trip to see this happening, a real roundup type of deal. Most of these people never saw it before. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was a fun deal. Art Cook used to give the vaccination shot, and uh, he was there giving the vaccination shot and shot himself in the leg, so we had to call an emergency hospital to get him out of there. Uh, he vi vaccinated himself. He never did live that down. He, he, like I said, he was an attorney trying to be a cowboy. But that, that was kind of funny. But it, it, they only did that two years, the smell and the kids wondering what they're doing to the cattle and all. It wasn't a real, it was fun, but the kids didn't really understand it. There's our light beer ad, less filling, right there at a roundup. <laughs> Philip Morris Company. But that's Art Cook, I think, on that horse right there. Okay. This is the first party we had outdoors. We did it every year, and they still do it. We did a July 4th celebration. We had games for all the kids, and uh, the activities committee put all, the, all these events. And I worked every event from 1981 to 1992, and when we shut it down, and we turned it over to uh, the HRCA, and then Jamie. Uh, Jamie Noble came in and took over and does all the events today, but for the first 12 years of the ranch, it was all the activities committee. We had this party over at North, and then, okay, go ahead. Next one. Where is he? No, just go forward. This is the first parade in Highlands Ranch. I was in charge of the July 4th celebration, and I said, we're going to have a parade. Said, How are you going to have a parade? <laughs> but anyway, we did a bike parade then, and all the kids decorated their bikes, and we gave a prize out to them. It might have been a case of beer. I'm not sure with all the beer we got from Mission Vale Company. But uh, anyway, this is the first event. I was in charge of that event, and I said, let's do a, let's do a bike parade. And then we had not only a bike parade, but we brought in all a dunk booth and uh, these little games kids can play, you know, throw a cane, a, a, 
uh, you know, like a little ring on a cane, then you got a prize type of deal. We had a dunk tank, and Dark Cook would get in the dunk tank. We had the sheriff of Douglas County in the dunk tank. And we had horses, kids could ride around. It was a great event. Then we always had the barbecue. We had the barbecue for that too. So that's the first parade in Highlands Ranch. Now this is Mary putting them on the right. This is the Delt family, they lived down the street from me. The first uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Mission Vale gave the, any resident living in the ranch, it might have been about 25 or 50 of us, they came along and gave us a turkey. And, uh, and this guy, the, the turkey right here that you can see, that's a guy by the name of Jeff Kappas. And to kind of give you an idea, he went from being a turkey to a senior vice president with Shea Holmes and just retired in July. <laughs> but that's, our, that's uh, uh, and Jeff Kappas is a very good friend of mine. But they gave him, he went around, I remember going to the door, hear a knock and we go out there and there's Jeff Kappas and Mary Putnam giving us a turkey. Mary was just a beautiful lady. I had a little story with her. My car broke down, I, and uh, she lived right by me, right across the street. And uh, I needed a ride into work. It was over in Inverness. And County Line Road was just a roller coaster. And she's from California. And she were driving down County Line Road. She's doing about 50 miles an hour in the snow. And she goes, wee, this is fun. I never drove in the snow before. <laughs> Needless to say, I got another ride home. I wasn't about to ride Nettie, but she was all excited. She never drove in the snow before, and here she is going 50 miles an hour on County Line Road. This is the first event that we had. This is all the people standing in front. Mission Viejo built that home for us, Santa's house. We had that every year right across the street. It's right where the Mexican restaurant is on Broadway there, and everybody came out. What a fun event, and uh, we painted it, but... Mission Viejo built the home for us, and that was the first event that we did in the ranch. And the activities committee did all the work on this. So you can see the trees, the big, those are the trees on Broadway. They weren't as big back then, but they're just planted. But uh, that was just a fun, fun time. The kids really enjoyed it. Go on. There's Art Cook, there's me and Carol, there's Dave Cooper, my best friend, Jeff Kappas. Uh, this is uh, Art Cooks, and he's got the big laugh there, but in the middle, kneeling down. So we're all standing there, and uh, that was the first Christmas in Highlands Ranch. That's before we got out there ahead of time, before all the rest of the people setting up everything, and we decided they took this picture a long time ago. This is, uh, we used to always have stuff for the kids. As I mentioned, a place to raise your family. In almost every event, we had all kinds, even this is Highlands Ranch Days that we had. And on Highlands Ranch Days, we had all the children come at the mansion and different grades in the school would come over and do some kind of song with an outfit on. And that was, we did, uh, the events that we did here in Highlands Ranch was, oh God, I'm really going probably too long. You want to pull me off yet? Okay. But uh, anyway, uh, we had the uh, Santa's arrival, we had the New Year's Eve party for a couple of years until we had a, it's, we didn't have a liquor license so you could bring your own liquor so everybody drank too much and we had a couple big fights, believe it or not, so they had to shut down the New Year's Eve party. Then we had, uh, uh, we had the uh, Easter egg hunt, then we had the 4th of July celebration, we had the uh, Fourth of July, oh, Highlands Ranch Day we created, and that in the beginning was just a lot of sports events and such like that. That was always in September. Then we had a New Year's Eve, not a New Year's Eve, but we had a Halloween party at the mansion, and that was really fun. And then they went on from there. Okay, this is the Highlands Ranch Fire Department. Metro District ran that. We had a partnership from up until about five years ago with Littleton Fire Department and Littleton Fire Department, uh, so we uh, shared expenses type of deal. He wasn't really the one of the firemen, that's hell. He worked for a Mission Viejo company, but they needed someone in the picture. I'm not sure where they got the dog. They never really had a dog like that. Okay. This is, a seven, this is the first store in Highlands Ranch. They had the 7-Eleven. They never made any money in that store. And then they have, uh, this is on Broadway there. Uh, then they had uh, a video store. There was a video. Then they put a post office in there. And then 
right along the side there is Mission Vale Financial Offices where you close down your house and next door to that was the design center. We lived right across the street. Our first house in Highlands Ranch was right on Broadway on that big hill there by Dad Clark. And uh, we could, when we first moved into the ranch, we could see Pikes Peak to Long's Peak from our backyard. And this is right across the street. This is where by Outback and that is now. Go ahead. The what? The library didn't, this picture is not in early 81. The library wasn't put there until about 1987. Mission Viejo moved out of that building because they needed a bigger building to put their uh, uh, design center in. So they, uh, that initially was the design center for Mission Viejo Company. This picture, as you can probably see from the cars, this is at least six, seven years later. That's it then. Oh, they're here. I didn't see you guys. Uh, how are you doing? I remember going to your 40th birthday party. Oh, that was uh, uh, Dave Herskovitz's 40th birthday party at your house, and they brought that nurse over to sit on his lap. That, that was 1982. Our cook is out in California. He died, unfortunately, about three years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough deal. <laughs> so the question that I have is uh, my father-in-law tells this story. One of the reasons that he moved to Hines Ranch and brought him down there, I told him they saw him coming a mile away. Uh. Was there was a brochure, and I seen the brochure in the original paperwork back in the eight, early 80s, of a, a Highlands Ranch Reservoir, hence the name Bayfield and things like that. Whatever happened to the Highlands Ranch Reservoir, why was that never built? Because he still wants to go fishing in the Highlands Ranch Reservoir. No. He's not even... We, we, the reservoir we have here belongs to Englewood. We leased it for 100 years, and that's the one off of uh, County Line Road down there. We never had a reservoir designed for here. Then we, Joe Blake put the deal together, the reservoir we got on C-470 over there. Joe Blake put that deal together. They built it for $40 million. We condemned the, the, uh, the gravel pit there, and we built that thing for $40 million. It opened up in 2002, and if we built it from start to finish, it was we would have had to spend $130 million on it. But Joe Blake had to get 10 different organizations involved to get that, they called the Platte River Reservoir. That's the second reservoir for Highlands Ranch. Here, let's Actually, it's one of the first plans. There was a plan for a reservoir over where the King Super's in the middle of Highlands Ranch is. If you go just directly west of there, and it goes through a dip, where the reservoir was in some of the original plans that we've seen. Uh, but what I've heard in the past is that uh, when they did the financial numbers, the lakefront properties did not offset the land that would be taken away by the uh, water. So in the end, they chose for financial reasons not to build the reservoir. <laughs> He's been waiting 50 years for that answer. <laughs> Let me answer the question. <clears throat> you talk about a reservoir in Holland French. The, the conservation situation there was a fellow that lived in one of the cottages on Highlands Ranch and went the caterpillar of Mr. Phipps's. He built a whole bunch of reservoirs around here, and there's still evidence of them on the South Ranch now, the, what they call the outback country. So that wasn't the first reservoir we're talking about. There's a whole bunch of, they weren't very big, no fish in them, but it did, there was a lot of that. Yeah, I just wondered where the polo grounds were. Where were the polo, polo grounds? grounds? The polo grounds were on the road alongside of where you come off of 85 to go up to the law enforcement center. That flat piece of ground was, that's where the polo grounds. That's where that picture was taken. Oh yeah, I just want to make a comment. My wife and I moved in there in 1982, in the summer. 
I will live right after you with us. But I, I was thinking, give it a few years, I'm going to start building in the green room. That is one of the pleasures that we have had, because we walk there every day, that they still have the green room, as it was back in 1982. What was that? I have no idea. You, uh, you were here in 82. Well, you, maybe it was you and your wife with a, did you have a collie dog? No. Well, somebody was on the dead. We used to call this Gulch's Cove. Dad Clark Gulch, Dennis, Dennis, Dennis Gulch. <laughs> we were chasing a cow up Bennett's Gulch, and this lady was walking her dog with her husband. And here came the hounds, and she picked that great big collie dog up, weighed as much as she did, and went to screaming, Don't kill my dog, don't kill my dog, don't kill my dog. <laughs> And I galloped up to her and said, it'll be okay, lady. Oh, she said, I'm scared to death. Don't you kill my dog. Don't you kill my dog. <laughs> you keep saying the cottages. Did you live right next to the mansion uh, in the ranch homes? Uh, yes, we did. Okay. There's two little cottages there, and we lived on the one. West one. You and your wife? My wife, and that's where my daughter that you met was born. She was born in Denver, but that's where she came. And then her brother, who was two years older than she, we, we lived there until 1965, when the flood came and destroyed the, the buildings down on the river, where the, the foreman, Morgan was his name. Right. And, and we we moved in from there so they could come up from the flooded out house in 65. So Miriam moved in about 1965 into that? Yes, that's okay. right. Uh -huh. When you lived there, were there cowboys in the bunkhouse? Did they actually live there? No, there weren't any cowboys there. There were cowboys in the bunkhouse when I first was in Highlands Ranch from over in the from the hunt club, there were, and they had a cook, mm -hmm. they had a full-time cook, and they had that little house that's behind the bunkhouse, a little bit south. That was the person that lived in there. They, his name was Chicken Charlie because he took care of the chickens. And uh, that, that, and then right below there was where the, the garages were, where Mr. Phipps had a collection of wonderful carriages. Yes, there were, there were several people lived in the big house. There was a butler, or two butlers, I think it was, and then several other people that fooled, didn't do the coal. L.C. Phipps Sr., the first one who came from Pittsburgh, he, they developed a lot of the coal in Colorado. And when we moved into that little cottage, it was heated with coal as was everything else there. Yeah, I have one more question. Do you think they have the same Santa house as they did back then? Because they still have that Santa house at the, on Broadway. <laughs> I, I did under the house. The uh, little Santa house. Uh, there is one that's still on the road on Broadway. Yeah, they had a Santa house. They built a new one about 20 years ago over there. The other one kind of fell apart after a while, and most of the houses in the Iron Branch lived in it. But uh, anyway, uh, they got another one down. But they put it out, I think, every year. Now they put it out in front of the Metro District yeah. building. They used to haul it to the mansion. Yeah, they used to live that. Well, before they redid the mansion, they had that big garage back there. And, you know, Craig McCallum parked his big motor home back there. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, he used to park, and I made those fences, the little white fences that you saw there. Our cook and I put them down in our driveway one day and made all those little white fences that used to be around the, uh, and then we made the mailbox too. We used to have a mailbox uh, in the beginning in a lady by the name of uh, uh, Valenny. She used to write back to the kids because she knew them all. 
and the kids were all excited because they thought Santa Claus from the North Pole knew all about them. But uh, we had a mailbox that we put right in front of there for the kids. It was a great deal. I was going to say, uh, what first, if you don't have a ticket for the drawing, can we at least get Paul's attention at the back and you'll make sure you get your ticket? Just raise your hand. Yeah. Also, when you were just talking about the mansion earlier, you said there was a room they draw the beer in. What room was that for the mansion today? <laughs> That's gone now that they remodeled it, but there's a little uh, way that when you went into the kitchen from the back where the garage it used to be, there was a little box of about eight foot by eight foot little room there and uh, it had a lock on it, but everyone filled it up with beer. It's still, it's still there and has liquor in it. It's got the little window. Oh, it's still there now? Yeah, the one with the little window. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's where Carson keeps the alcohol now. That was a cooler. That was a cooler for the big house, and uh, it was uh, used all the time. I think the question you asked me was about the house that's just west of the mansion. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, he says it's the Chum House. Actually, no, it's not the Chum House. It was built by Mr. Phipps's, one of Mr. Phipps's daughters, the Youngs, Chapman Young. The, that's right. And then the Chums were about two or three families later. And uh, that's, that's that history. Why did they stop in the roundup? Why did they stop with the roundup? Well, the uh, parents were complaining, the kids just smell, and they, you know, they're kind of roughing up those cats when they bring them in. And the kids really got excited over that. They did it two years, and uh, they just decided to pull the plug in on we used to have even at a Fourth of July celebration where we used to chase a greased pig. That only lasted two years because we had complaints for, you know, best treating animals type of thing. And that's why they put the hunt club and all that stopped here at the ranch because they should be able, in Philip Morris, to get pressure from animal activists type of thing to, uh, you know, that wasn't quite right. They didn't like the idea of chasing the coyote around with the horses and the dogs. And, and they, uh, so a lot of that stuff in the grounds, and that would all stop by Mission Bale Company because the activists and all that complaining and then being a big company like they were, they didn't want to fight that stuff anymore. It was mixed use out there also. At one time, they let me have the back rooms out by the cooler so you could go in there and 300 quail there to trade my hunting clothes to the south of the gym was generous with the use of the Highland Ranch. Yeah, he loved to come out walking my dog around and that. There were, there were still quail in some of those draws, but we had 300 of them caged up. The other thing they let us have was a mansion for a wedding last month. Yeah, ever. And they gave us the mansion for my daughter's wedding, Cam, Cam worked for it at it. A friend of mine from the helicopters, and they let us fly her out at midnight. Much to dismay everybody at the north of the mansion. <laughs> <laughs> they had no idea what was going on. What, what year was that? Help me out, honey, when Sarah got married. 2008? Yeah, 2008. And it lifted off. We parked it down by the, by the big barn. Jeff had put it in there. And Sarah buttonholed him after the ceremony in the dark and said, I'd really like to leave from the front steps. And I told him, go away. And the said, absolutely, way. And backed it in there in the dark through all those big pine trees and dropped that. L7 bell right in the middle of the grass. So she got to be Cinderella. <laughs> it was last week. They gave, a, they gave a mansion my daughter too to get married. <laughs> it, was, it was only, I think, Dave Cooper's uh, daughter got married there too, but they, they didn't give their mansion up. They had to get special permission from California and write letters and all that. But yeah, they gave it to my daughter too, and that was a tremendous wedding that we had at the mansion. But uh, pretty good. Any question? Um, I was just wondering what year did Highlands Ranch Parkway open up? Because what I, I lived on the other side of town. Well, that didn't, that didn't open up. The very first road from the ranch, we had a little entrance coming off of uh, Wilmore Nursery there. It's a little two lane road. County line was just a mess. You could barely get in and out of the ranch. The only way in and out of the ranch. And then Broadway ended right before, right at the end of Grove there, before Highlands Ranch Parkway. And then uh, 
no university or anything like that. And I, Highlands Ranch Parkway, um, that wasn't built in probably in town. I'm thinking around 85, 84 type of deal. I just thought I'd share with you that as soon as it opened up, there was no traffic. I'm just too very slow to get up and down that street. We first moved here. We're on right on Broadway, that big hill there. And we used to take our kids sledding, and we slid right out of Broadway. And then we did that for a few weeks. And all of a sudden, when Mission Bay put some signs there, and said, no sledding allowed. And because they thought we were going to get killed on Broadway. And I said, well, no one ever drives that road. <laughs> Dr. Damon, do you, did you ever have occasion to, to uh, bowl at the bowling alley at the ranch ever? Or, that, or is that defunct already by the time you were bowling? Yes, we did bowl there. Uh -huh. one, one lane that it was a little bit hectic because the floor was kind of wobbly. But we did bowl there, yes. Because I just saw one the two lane down the Bears today. And I was wondering, is there a local bowling leagues around here back <laughs> No, I don't think so. I've got to say something about family getting married and so forth in the big house. The first function we had there, my wife and I had our wedding reception there, and then our daughter had her wedding reception there, and then our one granddaughter got married there with the reception, and then our daughter's daughter got married and had her reception there. I'll tell you a funny story about when my daughter got married at her reception, her family, her husbands came from New Jersey. And during the reception, uh, the cattlemen at that time moved a bunch of cattle on the south side of the big house, and everybody from New Jersey thought we had staked that whole thing, but we had nothing to do with that. They thought it was a hell of a deal. All right, one last call for tickets. Can you take a look at Paul or get his attention? And we can take one more question. Who wants to be the final question of the evening? Oh, Sarah's got a question back there. Dr. Bevan, would you tell us about how, when you um, were in the upper place, how you had to go to, to uh, Castle Rock to school? Well, and didn't have a chance to ride a horse to Castle Rock to school, but it was a mile and a half from our house to Highway 85, and so I would walk down there to the highway a lot of the days and ride the bus to Castle Rock and then come back and walk home sometimes. One of the most embarrassing things of my life was when I was a freshman at Castle Rock, uh, which was a pretty small class, we had to wear a dress for some of the freshmen in Hazy type thing. I can still remember walking down that damn road with a dress on. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it, it was terrible. <laughs> and I had to walk home with a dress on too. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Dr. Beaman and Gary Club. We're going to get Jill to come up here. We have a giveaway. Uh, Jill, you want to tell us about the giveaway? And then you'll draw the This is a very self-serving giveaway. It's a free inaugural membership to the Senior Center. So it's $20 for residents or $25 if you don't. If you happen to already be a member, then please pass it along to somebody who isn't. <laughs> Thank you.